surgeries or helping to staff the CBACs right through that period. They have completely changed the way they have had to practice during alert levels three and four and to keep both themselves and their patients safe. And I want to say they've got through not just the COVID work, but a mountain of other work that they usually have from the care they provide their patients. Hasn't been easy, but I just really want to acknowledge and to talk all their efforts. So overall numbers uh, on contact tracing, since uh, August 11, there have been 3,346 close contacts identified and 3,305 have been contacted and are, are self-isolating. And for the most recent complete seven-day period, we have been able to contact 84% of close contacts and have them self-isolated within 48 hours of uh, being notified of a positive result, the benchmark there being 80%. Uh, there are now 74 people linked to the Auckland community cluster who remain in the Auckland quarantine facility, and that includes 58 people who have tested positive, as well as a number of household members. Today there are four people in hospital uh, uh, around the country with COVID-19. Two are stable and in isolation on a ward in North Shore Hospital. Two are in ICU, one at North Shore and one at Waikato Hospital. With today's six new cases... There are also four additional recovered cases, and our total number of active cases is therefore 125. 43 of those are imported cases identified in managed isolation and now in quarantine, while 82 are community cases. And our total number of confirmed cases now is 1,437. Yesterday, our labs processed 8,363 tests, uh, bringing the grand total to date to 831,000. 517. Our contact tracing system, as I've alluded to earlier on, is performing very well and it has shown us the importance of having a, a, a good connected contact tracing system right across the country. When we find someone with a positive test from COVID-19, we need to be able to quickly trace everybody who may have had contact with that person. And this is crucial to stopping further spread. Uh, ultimately, though, our contact tracing people system uh, also always relies on people, and if you test positive for COVID-19, we need to know not just uh, where you have been, but who you were with and uh, at what times. And on that note, it's encouraging we continue to see the number of people registering with and using the NZ COVID Tracer app continues to increase and that many people are recording uh, their uh, movements uh, of course, the new functionality in the app allows uh, people to put in more detail, even if they sign in electronically with the QR code. You can add detail around who you were with and the times you were there. There are now 2,161,000 uh, 2, registered users. And an average of 2.15 million scans took place each day over the last week. There's another uh, update on the release of the app today, and that will make scanning QR codes even faster and easier. And I'm sure, like uh, me, you appreciated that with the la last update, you didn't need to log back in. You remained logged in, and it will update automatically. You will be able to directly open the scan screen if you are logged in, and also bypass the login screen if you don't have time to enter your password and still be able to scan. Diary entries will be stored in the phone now for 60 days instead of 31 before they are deleted. This makes it easier for contact tracers to establish links, possible links between cases that may go back further than the 31 days. That doesn't affect the security at all. We cannot access your digital diary unless you choose to share it after a request from a contact tracer. Uh, there is also an NZ COVID tracer booklet available on the website to help people keep a written record if they prefer to where they've been uh, and, if, and who they've seen if they are not able to use the app. Just a comment now, I'd like to take a moment to uh, provide feedback on the worker at Bridges Hotel in Auckland who was identified as a case, as a ma maintenance worker there. The investigation on this has now closed and concludes that the most likely source of infection was a one-off exposure event uh, and that surface transmission in an elevator uh, that the worker used after a returnee from the USA who tested positive for COVID-19 is the most likely route of transmission. 
Widespread testing around the workers' contacts, including both household and workplace, did not find any other cases of COVID-19. They all tested negative and all had negative serology, which suggests they weren't earlier cases that passed it on to him. And I just want to acknowledge the support that this worker and the staff and management at Ridges have, have provided for this investigation. It's a complex process and the success relies on um, uh, engagement and cooperation from the case contacts and their employers. And I do want to thank them again for their support in completing that investigation. Uh, that's all I have to say to start with and I'm open to questions. Do those in the Mount Roskill subcluster make a deliberate decision not to disclose their close contacts? So as we've got more information from uh, Auckland Regional Public Health uh, late this morning, uh, it's, it's clear that uh, the case that uh, is associated with the college in Auckland, the student, and the new cases arising in this around the bereavement event were not previous contacts or close contacts of the self uh, of the uh, Mount Ross School event, and that the reason this new subcluster has arisen is because there was a visit by people who at the time didn't know, but who were infectious and visited the household. So as it transpires, with further um, information from AFS, these weren't people who we would have expected would have been identified as close contacts because there had been no prior close contacts with them uh, prior to the 27th when the exposure took place. So these people are not part of the church service and the yeah. wedding? Yeah, the, that's the, right. The subsequent ones. Yes, they're not members of that wider congregation, but they have they are linked back to it because they've been infected by a member of that congregation, clearly unintentionally. So but, how just that, how is that mini cluster? How you've said it, it's been challenging to deal with. How has it been challenging to deal? With? Do you mean this latest one? No, or? I mean the, the mini cluster in Mount Ross School. So the, mini, the, the Mount Ross School one, um, what I would say is that early on, um, as the public health unit was engaging with that church, there was uh, some reluctance of some of the members of that community to engage and or be tested. That was quickly overcome once we uh, worked with the Māori, or the public health unit worked with the Māori and Pacific teams at the DHB, and actually once uh, there was were good networks into or links into the community, there's actually been a high level of testing and support um, from that church community for the um, for the testing and follow up. So they are all now co cooperating with you. Well, I don't know um, the full extent. There, are, there were uh, originally 468 people associated with that wider Mount Roskill Evangelical um, Fellowship, which is quite a large number. Uh, and my understanding is that there, that there was a high level of uh, support for and cooperation with the testing. And how many of those have been contacted? Well, the contact was made uh, with all of them. Uh, not all have been tested, and there may be reasons for that, including their age. But um, they, they were all tested. Uh, many were tested in the first round, and we're just putting the call out for those people part of that fellowship, just to help us get really um, con to really confirm that there's no wider spread, that they all um, go and be retested. And just just Sorry, with the St Dominic's cluster, yes. how many close contacts have been identified so far? Sure. How many are in the community? How many are at the school? So if I can just relabel, uh, recall that cluster, one associated with a, a series of bereavement events, and one person from that, of the 14, is a student at St Dominic's. That was the student who was at school until last Friday morning. At this stage, um, Auckland Regional Public Health is just confirming who all the close contacts are. The message went out to the school last night. However, talking with, uh, regional, uh, with Auckland Regional Public Health today, um, we've advised that actually, as we did with um, Mount Alma Grammar, that we test all members of that school community, staff and students, um, because often there will be, there could be contact in a corridor, and it's just a precautionary approach we're taking there. So, so these six people today that were previously undisclosed, those contacts? Uh, no, these were all people who, um, actually two of them are um, associated with the Mount Roskill group, but were already in isolation. So they are from families that were already part of that um, uh, grouping, that, that sub-grouping. Uh, the, um, the others have been tested, have tested positive, and they were disclosed as close contacts through this new event that is associated with pre-funeral events and then a funeral. Is yes. one of them a um, health worker with high tier order? Uh, I don't think that's one of the um, people today. I think that's one of the cases yesterday who was with Hapo to Ho order. 
uh, and I think, and so that is one of the workplaces that has been followed up as, as having potential close contacts. And did that person visit the Mount Law School church or have involvement? I, I couldn't say. I think I think actually that person, uh, well, if I, I, well uh, aside from the, 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 the two people who were part of the Mount Law School grouping, who visited one of the who visited the household of the um, the bereaved person? All the others were not associated with the Mount Ross School um, group, and so they've been infected because they were at the household at the same time. And that involves several other workplaces. And I've talked about a bus driver, a school, and of course then there were people at the Tangi as well who who, who are close contacts. How many is the group now associated with the with the meeting class that we've given, and it's now? You know, there's this new event and these new mm. bereavement activities and another bus driver. Um, you said originally it was 468, but it must be hundreds more by now, given that it's... You know, uh, in terms of potential so. contacts, yes. Um, so with this latest um, events around the bereavement, there is uh, there are 108 contacts identified there. And of course already in the, in the fellowship, uh, the wider fellowship, which includes sort of 13 smaller um, groups that get together, there was already quite an extensive number of potential contacts. They are included in that 3,346, which is the number from the start of the Auckland outbreak. Sure, but I mean, uh, uh, how, do you know how many of the recently infected people who, um, how many of them were not in isolation when they caught it? Can you give any clarity? No, I don't, I don't have any clarity around that. But that's potentially, you know, they were out in the community for, for days, potentially. With well, um, what I would say is that there have been, since we first identified um, cases within the Mount Roscoe Evangelical Fellowship, there have been other cases emerge. They have, they have uh, been, um, almost all of them have been household contacts, so we would, as we would expect. So the transmission is still happening within families rather than people outside of that in the wider community. This is a, a sort of another um, little cluster that has emerged that links back. Um, where someone had gone and visited the household of the bereaved and infect has infected some other people, so that's led to another, it's sort of seeded another group of infections. That isn't part of the fellowship, but it does link back to it. The Health Minister has indicated um, the police has been brought in to support with the Mount Russell cluster. What has their role been, been in, in this? So just generally on contact tracing, we do work with the police uh, in, in a couple of ways already, and I'll talk about what's, what has been added to that. First of all, if we're having trouble um, getting the contact details from someone, we use the police through our finding services because, and we send them the details we have, and they, within a couple of hours, will turn around if they have information about the location of someone. Secondly, if we are having trouble finding someone who we really do want to identify as a close contact and we can't find them, and that's a very small number of people, then often police will support us in going out to find people or support the public health workers. In this instance in Auckland, we've also um, actually for the last uh, few days had a police liaison person over here uh, looking at our systems we're using here around our contact tracing just to see to help us identify what we could learn from the way police do their investigations, not to take control of our investigations. Um, and we've uh, uh, sent that uh, person up to Auckland this morning to go and just work with AFS to see what other support the police may need to provide around community liaison. So he's up there today. Uh, also, um, someone from the Regional Public Health Unit has gone up as well to support and see what other um, relief we might need to provide to the Auckland Regional Public Health Unit because, as you can imagine, the team up there is getting uh, quite tired. And can you tell me where, where that funeral was? Uh, no, I don't know where that funeral was. Just sorry, sorry can funeral, I just please. clarify, and I don't know if you, you may have answered it in that may have included it in that long answer, but the, did police investigate the allegations that the parishioners were meeting despite the self-isolation order, and was there an outcome? Uh, I don't know about an investigation per se, but I do know that there was a meeting held, I think, on the 15th of August, which was after Auckland was in an alert level 3 uh, um, stance, and that the, I understand that the police were involved in going to um, ask that meeting to disperse. But but no I don't, I don't uh, believe there was any investigation as such. And or like enforcement or, outcome or anything like that? No, that's not my understanding. You're best to ask Commissioner Costa. But I, I, you know, there would have been a number of events uh, during the Alert Level 3 period that the police would, as they do their first approaches, uh, 
is an education and engagement approach, and I understand in that instance that the people at that meeting dispersed. And can I ask some questions about um, the false positive case um, from Christchurch at the weekend? Yes. The press understands that it was a man who came for the mosque terrorists' sentencing. Um, we're wondering if you can confirm why and where he was tested in the first place and how many of his close contacts were notified before he was retested. Uh, I'll tell you what I know. So yes, this was someone who had travelled to New Zealand for the mosque sentencing. Uh, he completed 14 days of self-isolation, including uh, around day 3 and around day 12 testing. Both those tests were negative. He then actually had uh, two further tests once he left self uh, once he left, left managed isolation. The first was negative. The second, I think it was the second, uh, was a weak positive. Um, the characteristics of that test were suggested an old infection, and we've had a number of these previously. However, it was treated until uh, it was confirmed that it was uh, either not, uh, until it was confirmed it was not an active infection by follow-up tests, which were all negative. It was treated as if it could be a live case, and so his uh, immediate close contacts were also re-isolated with him and tested, and all their tests came back negative, which helped um, the public health unit draw the conclusion this was indeed an old case and not an acute or an active case. Why, why, was, why was he tested that those two further times outside of managed isolation? Um, it's not immediately clear to me. I think he was under the impression that he should be. He was not symptomatic throughout either his stay and he didn't have any symptoms and was tested, it may be that he just um, understood that he needed to have a further test, right. and he did that. And yeah. it seems like the Ministry of Health may have said that he was in managed isolation when, in fact, he was in the community and possibly considered positive. Is that the case? And uh, when, when he received the positive uh, test result, that was indeed from a test done, I think, at a CBAC, and so it was after he had finished his 14 days managed isolation and returned the two negative tests. So it was one of those results where, even on the initial result, our strong impression was this was an old infection, but all precautions were taken to identify, isolate close contacts and retest. But he wasn't shuttled back to the facility? Uh, I, I, I would have to check that. And can you just confirm that, like, how many like, days did this all play out? I would all have to, I'd have to check that as well. You, you mentioned this from LinkedIn. Seen, Sorry, I'm going to... Uh, uh, this is the first time we've seen, you know, a decent number of cases emerge in an, a level two environment. Mm -hmm. You know, how are those systems working to, to you know, ring fence this new subcluster associated with the bereavement event, and, and how confident are you that you're going to be able to surround that? Well, the two fundamental parts of that will be the testing and we've clearly got, uh, we know our system's got good capacity to test both the swabbing and then the laboratory processing. So oh. wide testing, wider than we might otherwise do um, and interestingly two of our Chief Science Advisor and the Director of Public Health, um, Caroline Mack and I, talked with their counterparts in, uh, uh, in New South Wales just in the last day or two and this is what they're doing in Sydney is sort of um, when there is these cases, when these cases do come up, to do very wide testing, including of casual contacts, and we've been doing that, and we'll continue to do that. And secondly, having that um, contact tracing ability, um, capacity stood up, and that ability to also um, bring in the public health unit people from around the country, bring them in virtually, because they can all access uh, uh, the contacts through the national contact tracing solution. So, the mainstay will continue to be testing, isolation. Um, support for isolation, including the use of managed uh, isolation facilities or the quarantine facility in Auckland, uh, and of course the, the rapid con isolation contact tracing. You, outside the context of the subcluster, just with the outbreak overall, uh, have you seen any other jurisdictions using genome sequencing like we're using it, and um, how, how much of a game changer has that been? Well, I can say it's been quite a game changer for us, and again, this is something that came up through the discussion with the New, uh, New South Wales uh, counterparts as well. They are using the genome sequencing and getting a rapid turnaround, because what it can do is tell you the linkage between cases and also who came before whom, so it helps you understand the chains of transmission. So we're actually working with ESR at the moment too to see uh, to stand up uh, um, some capacity to do genome sequencing in Auckland so that we can turn that around even quicker. This, uh, the uh, person uh, linked to this new spreader event, the, the funeral, were they tested prior to going to this funeral? Were they a, a close contact, a known close contact of, of people from, from the wider evangelical church? So um, the person didn't go to the funeral, but they went. They visited the home of the bereaved person, and um, they had been tested 
uh, because they were a known close contact uh, but didn't have the test result uh, when they visited the home, is my understanding. Mm. And in terms of uh, th this event that was held during Level 3, is there any known spread from, from the, the Mount Roscoe event that was held, I think you said, August 15th? Uh, it, it's hard to know whether um, the cases that have arisen, any, any of the cases that have arisen amongst a, a group of about seven families in that um, Mount Roskill Evangelical Fellowship, whether they were from that uh, August 15 event or from an earlier event. We can't exactly define whether, where the original case came from and therefore where the further spread came from. And what we're seeing with this new subcluster, the way it's spreading, the way that there's these new cases kind of popping out, tentacles going out, um, I guess, what color is sort of your dashboard flashing right now with these events? Uh, my virtual dashboard, oh, well, it's flashing orange, um, and it won't, it won't flash or go steady green until we're really confident we've got this outbreak, um, uh, you know, well, well, uh, well circled. Um, I should say that this, this grouping here that's appeared around this bereavement uh, is the only sort of additional sort of tentacle out from the Mount Roskill um, grouping, and there are no other ones that have emerged either over the last week or so. So it's it's um, it's a it's an orange, you know, it's raising some flags, um, and that's why we're working really quickly, including that widespread testing in the school, going out to, onto the bus trips and so on, to make sure we're capturing any possible contacts. And just just one last one: Do you, what is the size now of, of the Mount Roskill subcluster? How many cases are, are now associated to it? Uh, Look, I'd have to check, but I'm thinking it's just if you count this additional grouping, which is 14 associated with the bereavement event, my understanding was there were previously there were 18, so it's somewhere between 30 and 40, but we can uh, provide that information and follow up. Is it true that people in the Mount Ross School um, cluster refuse to go into managed isolation? Not that I have heard. Uh, I know that um, right since the start of the outbreak, there have been some families who have been, cons you know, have been... You know, not immediately welcome the idea of going into a quarantine facility, partly because they're worried of, they might be worried about pets, there are issues might be issues around income and so on, but that um, actually once there's engagement with them and all those matters are, are, are worked on with them before they are, are then go into managed isolation or into the quarantine facility, so no one's um, sort of forced in there. Uh, and, and you know, my understanding is that with that support being provided, that actually people are, are quite comfortable with going in. Do you mean trust people are self-isolating? Well, um, I should say that right, right since the start of this um, pandemic, there has been always a, a, a component that, uh, that requires a high level of trust. Um, I, I think the vast majority of people do self-isolate. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Um, there will always be people who won't necessarily comply um, uh, uh, all the time with those expectations and our job is to support them to make sure that their welfare and other needs are met, that there's food being delivered, that they've got the support, if there are children, that there are activities that they can do and if necessary, and we have done this um, in this particular outbreak, break, to pro provide security for them if they want to be sure because one of the things that has unfortunately happened is there can be a little bit of negative reaction from the community to these people and often they're worried about if they're identified um, that they, you know, that they could be, um, uh, you know, verbally or physically abused. So we have um, offered and, in a couple of cases, provided security. Perhaps a couple more, two you, or three you know, more how, questions. How much of the initial reluctance to get tested was down to the people not accepting the science? Look, I, I couldn't say um, exactly. Uh, I think there are a number of reasons why people don't like being tested um, or want to be tested. I guess first of all they have to accept that it is a real thing, and secondly, of course, it's it, it, it's a it's a, it is an invasive test having the swab put up your nose, and some people describe it as uncomfortable. Um, uh, what I can say though is this is show, this has shown this whole outbreak has shown that if you have very if you have good engagement with these communities, actually they come forward and they they, they are very willing to be tested, and we've seen right through that our rates of testing amongst Pacific have been over double those of the general population through this outbreak, particularly in Auckland, Waitamata and counties Monaco, DHBs, and likewise Māori rates have been higher than the population average. Mm. Confident there's no more reluctance not to be tested? Well, I think uh, only in this, individuals will have reasons, and for the same reasons that sometimes people uh, do or don't um, undertake a diagnostic or a treatment procedure, some people um, uh, don't get vaccinated when uh, the recommendation is they are vaccinated. So there will always be, um, people will always have a range of views and perspectives, but 
um, my, uh, my clear impression is that this Mount Roskill group has been very supportive, and in particular because there are members of the congregation who are nurses and they've got involved in actually helping explain and support the testing. You can have you talked about that? So, uh, one more, sorry, sorry one more there. Just that, that, there's the initial reluctance there and that yeah. meeting on August 15th. Yeah. Have you ever, in light of those, considered using the Health Act's uh, um, ability to enforce quarantine on people? And is that something that you are still looking at as a possibility? To well, it's absolutely a possibility. And I should say that, actually, the reason why in the legal basis for people going into the quarantine facility in Auckland is because I have issued a directive under the Health Act. Um, it doesn't... Uh, I haven't then had to direct individuals because they have refused, but that is the legal basis that is there. It's not, it's not applied as a sort of a, a, a strict enforcement requirement, but it just provides the basis for the medical officer of health to request that people go into, into quarantine. Uh, you've, you've spoken about the invasiveness of the test. Are there other softer options for people who are squeamish about having something shoved down their throat? Well, there are, there, there are two ways you can do the nasal swab. Um, uh, the one that's used for children is a slightly less unpleasant one that's at the back of the nose. The main, the main swab is the one that goes right through into the back of the, through the nose, the nasopharyngeal swab. So the first of those is apparently a bit less uncomfortable. I actually found out that's the one I had. It felt still felt uncomfortable enough, I can say. Um, of course, there's a lot of interest in, and, work, and, and ESR is doing work on um, sputum testing. The key thing there is to get a, a really good idea of how accurate it is before we start to use it. I think it will be particularly useful for staff in managed isolation and at the border who have to be tested regularly, like weekly. Uh, I think it will be much more pleasant for them, so we're very keen to see if we can make that testing available as a screening test uh, sooner rather than later. But it's not, it's not imminent, it's not in the next few weeks. You, you mentioned GPs earlier and the work they're doing. Has the Ministry's communication with GPs been outstanding in your mind or is there work to do to improve the information flow to doctors? It's a bit of a set up that question. There's always work to do um, and uh, some people might describe it as outstanding. There will be others who say, who say there's a lot of work to do. Look, we're continuing to work re really closely and I was just talking uh, this morning with the, the Head of uh, General Practice New Zealand, actually got a very nice letter from him and the Clinical Director of General Practice New Zealand yesterday thanking the Ministry for the work and uh, our ongoing commitment to working closely with them, so we'll keep doing that. Dr. Final question. Um, there's now been some 26 positive cases in managed isolation and quarantine from India. Uh, is there any consideration being given to restricting um, the flow of people from India to New Zealand um, because of the, this high proportion of positive cases? No, there hasn't been, and that's not something that would specifically be looked into. This uh, purely represents the fact that there is a very um, um, high and increasing rate of infection in India, and um, you will be reading about that. Remember that every person off every flight is treated as if they uh, could be carrying COVID-19 and, and hence the infection prevention control precautions and the regular testing. But obviously with that higher rate of infection coming off those flights from India, there's uh, you know, particular caution um, uh, and precaution being taken with people on those flights. Could I ask you one quick more question? Serological testing, could you just restate the Ministry's current position on that? So serological testing we are using and have used as part of this Auckland outbreak, in particular to help us understand whether um, there are people in households or in workplaces who may have been infected earlier, are not acutely infectious, but may have preceded the case that we have found. So for example, I mentioned earlier, we did serological testing on a number of the co-workers of the person at the Ridges Hotel as part of trying to find out whether he may have been infected, for example, through one of the nurses or one of the other people that worked there. All of that serological testing was negative. And likewise, early on, we had a large household where we were surprised only one of the people in that household tested positive. So we did some serological testing to find out if there may have been earlier infection from in, amongst members of that household, particularly children who may have been asymptomatic, and that testing was also negative. These, these uh, bereavement activity, uh, sorry, bereavement events, uh, the recent, uh, these cases, uh, and, and how yes. long, I mean, that could potentially push the tail out of this outbreak. It, it, it indeed could push the tail of the but outbreak we... out. Uh, well, it, it could, but again, the key thing here is um, that 
that, that any additional cases occur amongst people who are known close contacts already in isolation and have been tested as such rather than popping up elsewhere in the community. Thanks very much. I appreciate you coming along today.